Chapter Thirty Four of Little Women. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Thirty Four. Friend. Though very happy in the social atmosphere about her and very busy with the daily work that earned her bread and made it sweeter for the effort, Joe still found time for literary labors. The purpose which now took possession of her was a natural one to a poor and ambitious girl, but the means she took to gain her end were not the best. She saw that money conferred power, money and power, therefore, she resolved to have, not to be used for herself alone, but for those whom she loved more than life. The dream of filling home with comforts, giving Beth everything she wanted, from strawberries in winter to an organ in her bedroom, going abroad herself, and always having more than enough, so that she might indulge in the luxury of charity, had been for years Joe's most cherished castle in the air. The prize-story experience had seemed to open a way which might, after long travelling and much uphill work, lead to this delightful chateau on Espagne. But the novel disaster quenched her courage for a time, for public opinion is a giant which has frightened stouter-hearted jacks on bigger beanstalks than hers. Like that immortal hero, she reposed a while after the first attempt, which resulted in a tumble and the least lovely of the giant's treasures, if I do remember rightly. But the up-again-and-take-another spirit was as strong in Joe as in Jack, so she scrambled up on the shady side this time and got more booty, but nearly left behind her what was far more precious than the money-bags. She took to writing sensation stories for in those dark ages even all perfect America read rubbish. She told no one, but concocted a thrilling tale, and boldly carried it herself to Mr. Dashwood, editor of the weekly Volcano. She had never read Sartor Resartus, but she had a womanly instinct that clothes possess an influence more powerful over many than the worth of character or the magic of manners, so she dressed herself in her best and trying to persuade herself that she was neither excited nor nervous, bravely climbed two pairs of dark and dirty stairs to find herself in a disorderly room, a cloud of cigar smoke, and the presence of three gentlemen, sitting with their heels rather higher than their hats, which articles of dress none of them took the trouble to remove on her appearance. Somewhat daunted by this reception, Joe hesitated on the threshold, murmuring in much embarrassment, "'Excuse me. I was looking for the weekly volcano office. I wished to see Mr. Dashwood." Down went the highest pair of heels, up rose the smokiest gentleman, and carefully cherishing his cigar between his fingers, he advanced with a nod and a countenance expressive of nothing but sleep. Feeling that she must get through the matter somehow, Jo produced her manuscript, and, blushing redder and redder with each sentence, blundered out fragments of the little speech carefully prepared for the occasion. A friend of mine desired me to offer a story, just as an experiment, would like your opinion. Be glad to write more if this suits." While she blushed and blundered, Mr. Dashwood had taken the manuscript, and was turning over the leaves with a pair of rather dirty fingers, and casting critical glances up and down the neat pages. Not a first attempt, I take it. Observing that the pages were numbered, covered only on one side, and not tied up with a ribbon, sure sign of a novice. No, sir, she has had some experience, and got a prize for a tale in the Blarney Stone Banner. Oh, did she? And Mr. Dashwood gave Joe a quick look, which seemed to take note of everything she had on, from the bow in her bonnet to the buttons on her boots. Well, you can leave it, if you like. We've more of this sort of thing on hand than we know what to do with at present, but I'll run my eye over it, and give you an answer. Next week." Now Joe did not like to leave it, for Mr. Dashwood didn't suit her at all, but under the circumstances there was nothing for her to do but bow and walk away, looking particularly tall and dignified, as she was apt to do when nettled or abashed. Just then she was both for it was perfectly evident from the knowing glances exchanged among the gentlemen that her little fiction of my friend was considered a good joke, and a laugh, produced by some inaudible remark of the editor as he closed the door, completed her discomfiture. Half resolving never to return, she went home, 
and worked off her irritation by stitching pinafores vigorously, and in an hour or two was cool enough to laugh over the scene and long for next week. When she went again, Mr. Dashwood was alone, whereat she rejoiced. Mr. Dashwood was much wider awake than before, which was also agreeable, and Mr. Dashwood was not too deeply absorbed in a cigar to remember his manners, so the second interview was much more comfortable than the first. "'We'll take this,' editors never say I, "'if you don't object to a few alterations. It's too long, but omitting the passages I've marked will make it just the right length,' he said in a business-like tone. Jo hardly knew her own manuscript again, so crumpled and underscored were its pages and paragraphs, but feeling as a tender parent might on being asked to cut off her baby's legs in order that it might fit into a new cradle, she looked at the marked passages, and was surprised to find that all the moral reflections, which she had carefully put in as ballast for much romance, had been stricken out. "'But, sir, I thought every story should have some sort of a moral, so I took care to have a few of my sinners repent.' Mr. Dashwood's editorial gravity relaxed into a smile, for Jo had forgotten her friend, and spoken as only an author could. "'People want to be amused, not preached at, you know. Morals don't sell nowadays.' Which was not quite a correct statement, by the way. "'You think it would do with these alterations, then?' "'Yes. It's a new plot, and pretty well worked up. Language good, and so on.' was Mr. Dashwood's affable reply. "'What do you—that is, what compensation—' began Jo, not exactly knowing how to express herself. "'Oh, yes. Well, uh, we give from twenty-five to thirty for things of this sort. Pay when it comes out,' returned Mr. Dashwood, as if that point had escaped him. Such trifles do escape the editorial mind, it is said. "'Very well. You can have it.' said Joe, handing back the story with a satisfied air, for after the dollar a column work, even twenty-five seemed good pay. "'Shall I tell my friend you will take another if she has one better than this?' asked Joe, unconscious of her little slip of the tongue, and emboldened by her success. "'Well, we'll look at it. We can't promise to take it. Tell her to make it short and spicy, and never mind the moral.' What name would your friend like to put on it? In a careless tone. None at all, if you please. She doesn't wish her name to appear, and has no nom de plume, said Joe, blushing in spite of herself. Just as she likes, of course. The tale will be out next week. Will you call for the money, or shall I send it? Asked Mr. Dashwood, who felt a natural desire to know who his new contributor might be. I'll call. Good morning, sir and as she departed, Mr. Dashwood put up his feet, with the graceful remark, "'Poor and proud, as usual. But she'll do.' Following Mr. Dashwood's directions, and making Mrs. Northbury her model, Jo rashly took a plunge into the frothy sea of sensational literature, but thanks to the life-preserver thrown her by a friend, she came up again not much the worse for her ducking. Like most young scribblers, she went abroad for her characters and scenery, and banditti, counts, gypsies, nuns, and duchesses appeared upon her stage, and played their parts with as much accuracy and spirit as could be expected. Her readers were not particular about such trifles as grammar, punctuation, and probability, and Mr. Dashwood graciously permitted her to fill his columns at the lowest prices, not thinking it necessary to tell her that the real cause of his hospitality was the fact that one of his hacks, on being offered higher wages, had basely left him in the lurch. She soon became interested in her work, for her emaciated purse grew stout, and the little hoard she was making to take Beth to the mountains next summer grew slowly but surely as the weeks passed. One thing disturbed her satisfaction, and that was that she did not tell them at home. She had a feeling that mother and father would not approve, and preferred to have her own way first, and beg pardon afterward. It was easy to keep her secret, for no name appeared with her stories. Mr. Dashwood had of course found it out very soon, but promised to be dumb, and for a wonder kept his word. She thought it would do her no harm, for she sincerely meant to write nothing of which she would be ashamed, and quieted all pricks of conscience by anticipations of the happy minute when she should show her earnings and laugh over her well-kept secret. 
but Mr. Dashwood rejected any but thrilling tales, and as thrills could not be produced except by harrowing up the souls of the readers, history and romance, land and sea, science and art, police records and lunatic asylums had to be ransacked for the purpose. Jo soon found that her innocent experience had given her but few glimpses of the tragic world which underlies society, so regarding it in a business light, she set about supplying her deficiencies with characteristic energy. Eager to find material for stories, and bent on making them original in plot, if not masterly in execution, she searched newspapers for accidents, incidents, and crimes. She excited the suspicions of public librarians by asking for works on poisons. She studied faces in the street, and characters, good, bad, and indifferent, all about her. She delved in the dust of ancient times for facts or fictions so old that they were as good as new, and introduced herself to folly, sin, and misery, as well as her limited opportunities allowed. She thought she was prospering finely, but unconsciously she was beginning to desecrate some of the womanliest attributes of a woman's character. She was living in bad society, and imaginary though it was, its influence affected her, for she was feeding heart and fancy on dangerous and unsubstantial food, and was fast brushing the innocent bloom from her nature by a premature acquaintance with the darker side of life, which comes soon enough to all of us. She was beginning to feel rather than see this, for much describing of other people's passions and feelings set her to studying and speculating about her own, a morbid amusement in which healthy young minds do not voluntarily indulge. Wrongdoing always brings its own punishment, and when Jo most needed hers, she got it. I don't know whether the study of Shakespeare helped her to read character, or the natural instinct of a woman for what was honest, brave, and strong, but while endowing her imaginary heroes with every perfection under the sun, Jo was discovering a live hero, who interested her in spite of many human imperfections. Mr. Bear, in one of their conversations, had advised her to study simple, true, and lovely characters wherever she found them, as good training for a writer. Jo took him at his word, for she coolly turned round and studied him, a proceeding which would have much surprised him had he known it, for the worthy professor was very humble in his own conceit. Why everybody liked him was what puzzled Jo at first. He was neither rich nor great, young nor handsome in no respect what is called fascinating, imposing, or brilliant, and yet he was as attractive as a genial fire, and people seemed to gather about him as naturally as about a warm hearth. He was poor, yet always appeared to be giving something away. A stranger, yet every one was his friend. No longer young, but as happy-hearted as a boy. Plain and peculiar, yet his face looked beautiful to many, and his oddities were freely forgiven for his sake. Jo often watched him, trying to discover the charm, and at last decided that it was benevolence which worked the miracle. If he had any sorrow, it sat with its head under its wing, and he turned only his sunny side to the world. There were lines upon his forehead, but time seemed to have touched him gently, remembering how kind he was to others. The pleasant curves about his mouth were the memorials of many friendly words and cheery laughs. His eyes were never cold or hard and his big hand had a warm, strong grasp that was more expressive than words. His very clothes seemed to partake of the hospitable nature of the wearer. They looked as if they were at ease, and liked to make him comfortable. His capacious waistcoat was suggestive of a large heart underneath. His rusty coat had a social air, and the baggy pockets plainly proved that little hands often went in empty and came out full. His very boots were benevolent and his collars never stiff and raspy like other people's. "'That's it,' said Jo to herself, when she at length discovered that genuine good will toward one's fellow men could beautify and dignify even a stout German teacher, who shoveled in his dinner, darned his own socks, and was burdened with the name of Bear. Jo valued goodness highly, but she also possessed a most feminine respect for intellect, and a little discovery which she made about the professor added much to her regard for him. He never spoke of himself, and no one ever knew that in his native city he had been a man much honoured and esteemed for learning and integrity, till a countryman came to see him. He never spoke of himself, and in a conversation with Miss Norton divulged the pleasing fact. From her Jo learned it, and liked it all the better because Mr. Bear had never told it. She felt proud to know that he was an honoured professor in Berlin 
though only a poor language master in America, and his homely, hard-working life was much beautified by the spice of romance which this discovery gave it. Another and a better gift than intellect was shown her in a most unexpected manner. Miss Norton had the entree into most society, which Joe would have had no chance of seeing but for her. The solitary woman felt an interest in the ambitious girl, and kindly conferred many favors of this sort both on Joe and the professor. She took them with her one night to a select symposium, held in honor of several celebrities. Joe went prepared to bow down and adore the mighty ones whom she had worshipped with youthful enthusiasm far off. But her reverence for genius received a severe shock that night, and it took her some time to recover from the discovery that the great creatures were only men and women after all. Imagine her dismay, on stealing a glance of timid admiration at the poet whose lines suggested an ethereal being fed on spirit, fire, and dew, to behold him devouring his